Good evening, church. I greet you all in the precious and lovely name for Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This evening, I can thank Pastor Louis and the leadership for allowing me this privilege to share in God's word tonight. I pray that you'll be blessed. And we need to remember uh, the people in Tangat and what they faced and the surrounding areas as well. <clears throat> you know, when you look at this disaster that's happened so suddenly, uh, we have to question our lives and ask ourselves, uh, you know, are we ready when the Lord comes? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. No one can predict the future. But the one thing we can be assured of is that I know my standing with God. You know, your theme for the church for this year is in step with the Spirit. In step with the Spirit. I pray and hope that each one of us are striving for that mark to be in step with the Spirit. In everything we do, the way we speak, the way we walk, the way we behave and carry ourselves out, to be in step with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, let's dig into God's word tonight. Uh, the book of James, chapter 1, we'll read verse 22 to verse 25. Book of James. I'm reading from the NASB, NASB translation tonight. The word of God says, <coughs> But prove yourselves doers of the word, and do not merely, he, do not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer is like a man who looks at his natural face in a, in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately, immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. God always blesses the reading, hearing, and sharing of his word. Amen. Now, when I was a young boy, uh, we used to play with wooden swords. We should make them with broomsticks and wood, right? And we'll be playing with one another. After you watch television programs, right, with sword fighting, we'll be doing the same thing, right? And as I grew older, I got a real sword up, right? right? And guess what I wanted to do? No, not play sword fighting, right? The first thing you get in your hand, like anyone else, you get a you get an op option to drive a fast car, you're going to test the speed. You're holding a sword in your hand, and you're going to cut something. Right? Logic, you're going to cut something. And you know, I mean, listen to scripture here, and uh, you look at what God is saying in his word, right? When we think of God's word, we often consider it that he has power, it has authority, its role as a sword that pierces through falsehood and defeats, defends against the enemy. In Hebrews 4.12, it tells us, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, before we wield this word as a sword, dear family, it must serve, first serve as a mirror. That's why I titled my message this evening. The mirror in the sword. The mirror in the sword. If you had a, in the, back in the days, when you look at the old swords, they were always polished silver. So you could see a reflection on it. Right? And that being said, before we use God's word as a sword, we must first use it as a mirror. God's word as a mirror reveals our true selves, reflecting back the areas where we fall short and need his grace. Each one of us falls short. We need the grace of God. Can you all agree with me on that? Now, <clears throat> James 1, 23, 24 warns about the danger of hearing the word but failing to apply it. Now, if you want to keep in step with the Spirit, you all know in the book of Ephesians, it mentions that the word is the sword of the Spirit. The word is the sword of the Spirit. Now, here are three guiding principles to consider before you pull God's word out from its sheath. The one thing we all need to do, always as believers and saints of God, and sometimes, you know, when we, uh, we learn a little bit of God's word, we go for Bible study, we get a little bit excited, right? The first thing you want to do is take that word and put somebody else with it. You want to give somebody else, right? But we need to check ourselves first. So the first point I'm talking about tonight is check yourself in verse 23 and verse 24. It's about self-examining yourself. Self-examining yourselves. 
We need to check ourselves before using scripture to address others. And that's what we're famous for. Somehow we think we are the judges. Somehow we think that we know it all, right? I went Bible college, my head got a little bit fatter as well. You know, Dr. Thomas always tells us, we measure your head after you finish because your head gets a little bit bigger, you know, as you're studying there, right? Don't become too full of ourselves. Jesus taught about this in Matthew 7, verse 3 to verse 5. Right? He thought about urging the person to pull the log out of his own eye before looking at the splinter in his brother's eye. Right? Because that's what we tend to do. We need to check ourselves. Don't go tell somebody else, say, you know what, go and brush your teeth and your teeth is still yellow. You know? Or worry about what the next person is doing. Or don't take advice from somebody uh, about your, how to bring up your children when they haven't got any children of their own. So we need to check ourselves, check where we are with God. I had an uncle that stayed in Mirbank, and he's late now, right? Uh, he had a, he tramped a chicken bone, small chicken bone, he tramped it, he affected his toe. Didn't worry about it, didn't want to bother about it. Eventually, the toe turned gangrene. They cut it off. So we used to go up and down, my dad used to go up and down trying to help him with the house and renovations. And he refused to still examine how the toe was doing. The whole foot turned, turned, turned gangrene. And he ended up taking his own life. All because he refused to examine, to check himself. It's the same with us. When it comes to the word of God, the word of God prompts us to examine ourselves. Whenever you read the word of God, it's always challenging you. Right? I'm the first one that, when I'm preparing scripture, I'm the first one that the word speaks to. It speaks to me. Check yourself first before you go out and tell something to somebody else. Don't ignore what you see in yourself after you get a glimpse of God's word. Don't make excuses, right? Many people go to the hospital now and then for a full body examination, checkup, once all checkup. Then when you go for this checkup, right, the doctor will tell you what's wrong. I'll never forget Uncle Johnny, uh, <laughs> Uncle Johnny, Johnny Peter. He used to say, whenever you're going for examination, He'll eat the sugary stuff and do everything, but just before you go for examination, you'll do training the whole week. So go to the hospital, sugar, everything is all right. That's very sharp. That's very sharp. Some of us, some of us are like that. You know what we're going to do? We're going to live a wild life, a normal life, right? Then you have a funeral happening in church, that week they're going to church. That week they you're praying. Only when you hear something bad about to happen, that's when you're praying now, that's when you're in the word of God. The rest of the time, you're going to go do what you want to go do. No one knows you're a Christian the rest of the month, except the special days. Then they know, this guy is a Christian. Wow, can't say. Can't say this man's a Christian. Right? So we need to check ourselves, dear family. Self-examination. Right? So if we're checking ourselves regularly, examining ourselves regularly, no matter what tomorrow brings, we know that we are ready. Amen? We know that we are ready. We know that we can go give someone advice. We know that we can speak to somebody that went through a problem because we've been through it. We've examined ourselves. It's, uh, it's very sad when we get believers that don't examine themselves. They've been in church right through, right? And they try and go and give others advice. Try and give others advice. It's so, so sad that in the house of God, sometimes there are people sitting there who claim to be Christians, but they're not really. I can tell you this much. When I was going, my, um, going to Bible college, and we used to go to churches, we had to visit churches. We had to go visit churches as part of the mission group. We go. So I went to my wife, and uh, for those of you who know Pastor Ronnie, his daughter-in-law. That time she wasn't his daughter-in-law, she, she came with us. I was going in front to do the word or something like that, and my wife and uh, uh, Pastor Ronnie's daughter-in-law were sitting down, and a member of the church came to him and said, you know what, that's my seat, move. And I was shocked when I heard this, because I was thinking, you know, okay, they are, they are believers, they know God, right? And not in this church. They said, move. Anyway, I'm just thinking, can you believe, can you imagine if a broken spirit came through that door? Someone that was hurt, someone that was hearing about God, they heard about Christians, and they said, okay, let me try it out. Let me just try it out. Right? And they go into the house of God, and somebody can tell you, move. If it was me, and I was a non-believer, I walk out that door. Right? So we're going to examine ourselves. Am I living according to what God wants me to live? Am I being the vessel that God wants me to be? Not now and then, not on special occasions, but every single day are we checking ourselves. I admire Brother Clive, they said he keeps all the receipts 
and Nancy agreed with him, you know, the salesman or whatnot, keep the receipts. I'm very bad with receipts. Right? If you know where things are, you know things are in order in your normal life, this is where A, B, C, D is, how about your spiritual life? When you're looking into the mirror, hey, nowadays guys take longer in front of the mirror than ladies. You know that? When they go in front, men groom themselves very nicely, you know that? Don't over-groom, but right, guys? Grooming is important. Please don't get me wrong. Trimming your nose hair and all that is very important. Right? But just like how we do that, before we go to work or for the young guys going out on a date, or the ladies, right? They're going in front of the mirror, checking everything first. I have to check before you leave the house. Right? How about checking yourself where you are with God's word? Checking where God is in your heart. Checking where God is in your life. Is he taking precedence in your life? Are you, before you leave home, are you praying? Are you seeking his face? Are you reading the word of God? Are you checking where you see your, your, your standards are right for your children? Children, are you checking to see if, yes, if mommy and daddy don't wake me up Sunday morning, I'll wake up myself and I'll go to church. Where are we with God? And after you check yourself, the one thing you need to do is, you need to change. I'm giving you three C's tonight, tonight right? Cold days like this, you'll need the vitamin C. Need to change. Some ladies and men too. Like I said, we check ourselves in the mirror. You go there, examine yourself. The one thing you need to do, you need to change. And you know, ladies, sometimes you all are so bad, they'll give men a hard time. The one thing you'll do is you're not sure about the outfit, they'll go in front of the men. How do I look? That poor guy is sweating bullets. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to tell you. If he tells you, yes, you look nice, the whole thing yeah, I'm wearing, you say you look nice. You're lying. Hey, finish. There's no, there's no winning. Right? So you'll go, you'll, you'll go check yourself, and then you realize you need to change something. Right? You need to change your outfit, never go with the earrings, never go with the shoes, something or the other, never go with. Right? And you will change. Now, time spent in front of the mirror literally is a lot nowadays. The time, time spent in the mirror of the sword is more important. Because that will tell you what you need to change. What you need to change. Each one of you have a different gift. The fruit of the Spirit is in each one of you. Each one of you are greater in some things than the other. Some of you may be good at greeting at the door, but bad at keeping the mouth shut now and then. Right? Some of you may be good at reading the word, but you may lack empathy. The certain things you may be good at, but certain things you need to change. You need to be transformed. Dear family, Romans 12, 2 instructs us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. This has to change first. This has to change. If you don't think anything's wrong with you, you think you're perfect, you're not going to change. There is no perfect Christian. There is none. If you think you learned all you can learn, then you are not very smart. I don't use bad words, right? You're not very smart. You know, Pastor Louis, he studied so many things, he's still studying up to now. Right? You need to continuously change. This transformation prepares us to wield the sword effectively with humility. The Word of God, yes, it is there to change us, dear family. The Word of God is to transform us, right? But sometimes the way we use the word of God is, is discouraging to others. When you speak the truth, speak the truth in love. Right? I know when I was in, at work in a circular world, and you get these people that come from a funeral, and you'll say, what's your Christians like that? Eh? Whenever we go to Christian funerals, all we hear is going to hell. That's all we hear. And are we bringing them closer to God or are we pushing them out the door? Please don't get me wrong. We have to speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. Speaking to about my God, who my God is to me. Right? It changes. Look in front of the mirror and it changes you. The word of God changes you, dear family. Like I mentioned about when you go for a full examination to the hospital and the doctor tells you your cholesterol is high, your sugar is high, what would you do? You'd be a fool not to change. You have to go on a diet now, start jogging now, do things a little bit different, right? I mean, I don't look this young, you know what I mean? I'm getting old. And now you realize you can't do things like you used to do before. The heavy things you pick up now, back is sore, finished. Eh? Not like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back now. I say, ow, my back. 
different. Right? As you get older, you realize things change. But the method you do things, the method, the way you do things, especially when it comes to the Word of God, that should be stronger than ever. Before I should pray for two minutes, now you pray for half an hour. And it feels like nothing. We were praying Sunday, and the time went so fast, our elder told us it didn't feel like half an hour we went through spending time in the, in the presence of God. So we need to change. And you know, when you change, when you ask God to help you to change, change is not easy. Amen? Sometimes you're stuck in your ways. Change is not easy. Especially, you know, for certain people that are fixed in their ways, change is not easy. Change is not easy. You can't tell them what to do. They'll tell you straight, we did it like this for all the years, we'll do it like this again. That, that's some people. There are some people. There was, there was one church I was in, I won't spend the name, right? It came to Christmas carols. You know what? Yeah, it came December. December. And they asked me to convene. So I went on top, I chose my song, waited upon God, fasted, prayed, took some songs, and went to one carol, and the rest a normal song. The backup team took off with me. You don't know it's Christmas time. Huh? When you see Christmas carol, I said, from December, from beginning. I said, yes, we always do it. I said, yes, but, uh, you know, uh, these are worship. No, those are worship songs. I said, the songs I chose, they're not worshiping God. Right? That's the way they did it from before, and they do it the same thing now, too. Really? Dear family, if you can't change, hey, wow. Y'all know, for the old EBC members here, y'all know this. I'll be, I'll be crucified now without a tie. Y'all know the old EBC members, y'all know that, right? In the Mirbank church, they never had drums. It was evil. Truth. It was evil. Drums are evil. Not supposed to be in the church. Today, there's drums, eh? There's change. There's transformation taking place. We need to change, right? We need to change. And the Word of God helps you to change. The Word of God teaches you. I love the way Jesus taught. He brought everything so practical and so life and so, you know, in line with people in the lives and what they do. That's what Jesus did. And, you know, like I said, transformation is not easy. In John 15, 1 to 7, one of the things Jesus says, he says, verse 1 verse 2, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Right? So at times when you allow God to change you, to prune you, dear family, it's not going to be easy, but it's for your benefit. Amen? It's for your benefit. And remember when I said this at the beginning, you know, that uh, we should not look at changing others. Because the vine dresser there is known as God. He's the vine dresser. He's the one that is the pruning. For those that abide in Christ, that are, those that are in Christ, God does the pruning. Not you. I'll give you the word. The pastor can give you the word. The word has to change you. Not me. I think over experience and time, we realize this, that you can tell someone to change and you can go blue in your face, you can do what you want to do. That person refused to change after they heard the word of God. It's sad because Judas was the same place. He, he was with the word every single day. He was with the word. He heard it. He saw the miracles, yet he refused to change because the Bible recognizes him as a thief putting his hand in the money basket. He refused to change. And in the end, what took over? Greed. 30 pieces of silver. Same thing. We need to change, dear family. I know we're going to time of prayer tonight, so I won't be too long. Right? And after you checked yourself, after you've changed and transformed, then you're challenged. Because in verse 25, it mentions that, <clears throat> but one who looked intently at the perfect law the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. To become an effectual doer. After we've checked ourselves, after we've changed, we need to take on the challenge to do what the word says. Like I said in the book of Galatians, it's mentioned there, in step with the spirit. In step with the spirit. You need to be challenged, dear family. And if you're challenged, then you want to do what the word of God says. Not just be hearers of the word, but do what it says. Right? When the word says in the book of Matthew 28, you should go forth and preach the gospel. Are you going forth and preaching the gospel? Are you sowing into missions? 
as the lifeline of the church. Are we doing these things to honor God? Using God's word as a mirror fosters a grace-filled heart. In Galatians 6, 1 advises us, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you will live by the Spirit, should restore that person gently. So this is where it brings a difference, you know, where, where it causes you to change and it's a challenge for most people that are educated and intellectually, uh, very highly intellectual, right? For them to go around to somebody and say, you messed up, you know what, you need to change. You don't want to go do it like that. You want to do it like a disciplinarian father who's very hard with that rod. But the Bible is clear. Be gentle. Speak the truth in love. Right? It's a challenge for some of us. It's a challenge. But if you go to somebody and say, you know what? You recognize them on the same level, on the same playing field. Say, I was a sinner as well once. God picked me up. God brought me. He can do the same for you. Just don't go back. Here I am. Lend a helping hand, dear family. Be a challenge. Be challenged to rise above the circumstance and situation. No matter where you may be, be challenged to rise above it. Look at this country and the votes and all that's going on. I'm not a politician. It's sad to see where this country is at the moment. Right? But we've got to rise above it. I always challenge the youth with this and say, you know what? One of the things the Bible does say is it says uh, you have to obey the law of the land. Right? You have to obey the law of the land. But when it comes to where the law of the land comes against the word of God, which do you obey? You obey the word of God. You obey the word of God. The ANC and the DA is pro-abortion. Both those groups are pro-abortion. If they come tomorrow and tell the church, church, I've got to do it like this, I've got to preach this, what would we do? You'll all be thrown to jail if you don't preach what we're telling you to preach. What would we do? We're bold enough to say, I don't care, like the three Hebrew boys, throw me into jail. I still praise God. I still worship Him. Because trust me, we are facing challenging times as well. I feel more sorry for the young youth and children that are in school and the things they have to face. I feel sorry for the young parents of nowadays. They don't want to state whether the child is boy or girl in the birth certificate. These things that are coming, dear family, but where do we stand when it comes to the things of God? How does the word affect you? How does the word change you? Recognize our own imperfections. When you recognize our own imperfections, it cultivates empathy and guiding us to correct others with love and gentleness. We aren't only challenged to change, but to help others learn the truth with gentleness. For people to change, like I mentioned, is not easy. The challenge is a struggle, especially in, the set in, their, in their ways, in their lifestyle. But each person is different. I've learned this as a minister, as a father. I've learned each person is different. Each person has their own grace. And you may have someone sitting in church and you spoke to one person one way, but you're speaking to someone else in a totally different way. Because that person is different from the rest. God created us different, created us unique, dear family. Right? So, like I said, we're living in challenging times. But we can be assured that when we check ourselves and we change, we are up for the challenge. Amen? We are for the challenge. We are there to go forth, tell somebody about Jesus. I know this church has, uh, <clears throat> on November, uh, they'll have a, oh, God, I can't get the word now. What is it? Evangelism Sunday. <laughs> Evangelism Sunday, right? They'll have Evangelism Sunday. And you're all encouraged to go and evangelize. And when the first time I went evangelizing, it was a challenge for me. I could barely talk properly. And you want me to tell somebody else about Jesus. But you know when you have the Spirit of God living in you, and you check yourself and you change and you're transformed, it's no longer you that's speaking, but the Spirit of God is speaking through you. That's who's speaking. He gives you that boldness, power, and a sound mind to do what he's called you to do. That's the God who speaks. It blesses my heart when you have somebody who's so quiet in church and finally now they're bubbling with the Spirit of God. They're bubbling. You can see the change. Literally, you see the change. In PBC, we've got that. We see the change in certain people and I go to them and say, praise God, we've seen the change in you. We've seen it. And they get excited and they want to do more for God. Right? 
Slowly by slowly, they checked themselves. They began to change all through prayer and through the word of God. Because I don't compromise this. You don't compromise this. Trust me, I've had it all. People come and say, you know what, we're going to have a roast pastor for lunch. They're going to roast you after, you know, by Rome. They roast the pastor. This is what the pastor said. This is the way he behaved. He spoke a bit fast. They used his word, yeah, you know, so forth. And I've had challenges, dear family. We've had debates about clubs and we have debates about tattoos and all these things we have debate but I always go back to the word of God this is challenging, the word of God is challenging it's meant to change you but if you check yourself and realize yes I need to be changed, you're checking yourself you know for a fact you need to be changed right normally my wife is my mother, I go by and say oh look okay, she broke my heart I went to the professor, okay then she asked me, you combed your hair I thought I combed my hair, what happened And that's what we need to be, dear family, as children of the Most High God. When you share the word of God, and someone can reflect off you, see the change that needs to take place in their lives. See the way you're living. Trust me, no one that's, that's living in sin out there and living in the world out there, no one's going to change if they see you as a churchgoer doing the same thing. No one's going to change. But if they see you as a churchgoer, they know what you were, and suddenly you begin to change. Then they're going to do something different, amen? Yeah, I've got my friend Roger sitting at the back. He knows me from Expander days. He can tell you some stories when I was first joined Expander and I began to change along the way. Right? Only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. Let me close, dear family. So, dear family, tonight, I want you to remember this. We are all works in progress. None of us are 100%. Amen? None of us are 100%. I thank God for this, his word, right? The mirror in the sword. There's always a mirror in here showing us where we faltered, where we failed, how we need to change, dear family. So don't let it be a once in a year thing, like your hospital checkups, right? Let it be a daily thing, a daily thing. Where you can check yourself and say, yes, I need to change that. I need to change this and certain things. Please forgive me. I need to change certain things, right? Because when we do that, we will realize that, Lord, with you, I am able, with you, Lord God, I am able to do what I couldn't do before. You know, putting this coat on right now, I don't know why my stomach is getting a bit fat. I said, nah, okay, a little bit. Right? So I know I need to change. Why? My family were diabetics. My dad was a diabetic, mom was a diabetic, high blood pressure, so I need to do something, am I right? I can't come later on in life and come tell you, hey, I've got sugar, I've got pressure. You say, you didn't know this is coming. You tell me, you didn't know this is coming. Right? So dear family, none of us are 100%, right? We all live by the grace of God. We live by the grace of God. His word helps us, his word helps us, challenges us to change. So let's live for God, Amen. And as we go into time of prayer just now, and I'll close and seal this word upon your hearts, right? Uh, remember something that there are people out there that's much more worse than what you have. The people out there need our prayer and they need our support. We may have something extra that you can bless. Please remember something. God is not mocked. As a man so, so shall he reap. When you decide to bless somebody and there's a voice telling you to bless somebody, the devil will not tell you to go bless somebody. He's a liar and a thief. That spirit is from God. So someone tell you, bless somebody else or something, don't say, get there behind me, devil. No, that's God speaking to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray.